Hi everybody, this is Gad Sad for the Sad Truth. Later today I'll be lecturing about psychology of decision making to my uh, graduate students. I'm teaching a course on uh, consumer psychology and decision making. And one of the points that I often try to hammer whenever discussing uh, decision making research is that there are really three separate uh, ways by which one can tackle decision making research. And they are normative, decision making, prescriptive decision making, and descriptive decision making. Let's look at each in turn. Normative decision making is where you establish a set of norms, in this case axioms of rational choice, and you say anybody who doesn't behave, who doesn't make decisions according to those axioms is behaving irrationally. And so this is a normative definition of rationality that is typically found amongst classical economists. Uh, what is commonly referred to as homo economicus. And so let me give you a few examples here you see in the slide. So for example, the transitivity axiom basically says that if I prefer, say, car A to car B, and I prefer car B to car C, then I must prefer car A to car C by transitivity. If I don't adhere to that axiom, then I'm behaving irrationally. And as early back as, I think, 1969, Amos Tversky had demonstrated that uh, that's actually not true. People do exhibit intransitivity of preferences. Here's a, let's look at the next one. Uh, this is known as a description invariance. The idea being that it doesn't matter how you describe a problem. If logically it is uh, consistent across the various descriptions, then you should always arrive to the same final decision. And of course, people don't adhere to this axiom. So for example, if I were to tell you that a hamburger is 90% fat free, uh, is the exact same thing as if I told you that the hamburger is 10% fat, yet people will have different uh, perceptions of the hamburger uh, depending on the manner in which it is described. Or to take another example, if I tell you that three out of five people recommend this particular toothpaste, it's the same thing as telling you that two out of five don't. And so the manner in which we frame a choice problem ends up actually uh, causing a preference reversal uh, which, according to classical economics, is a violation of rational choice. Uh, let's look at the third one, procedural invariance. Uh, if I were to uh, tell you which of alternatives A or B do you prefer, uh, so if I ask you to please rate uh, A on a scale of 0 to 100 and then rate B on a scale of 0 to 100, and then it turns out that you rated B higher, when I ask you to evaluate them separately, then if in, a, in another task, one were asked, here are two alternatives, A and B, tell me which one do you prefer? Then of course you should, if you're consistent, you should prefer, again, B to A, but it turns out that if you show people the alternatives simultaneously versus sequentially, you often get preference reversals. And again, that is a violation of rational choice. So the normative model of decision-making basically argues that there are certain axioms that we should abide by, and if we don't, then we are behaving irrationally. Now let's contrast that with prescriptive decision making. This is how you should make a decision so that you achieve some optimal benchmark. So typically you see this in operations research or what is also known as management science. Uh, typically here you have an algorithm that offers you some optimality you know, course of action. So the classic example, there are many. The traveling salesman problem in operations research is suppose you have a traveling salesman who has to do who has to travel through cities A, B, C, and D, and he cannot backtrack on his path and he has to visit each city exactly once. Which path path should he take uh, as to, in this case, for example, minimize his travel costs? And so if you look at here the figure, uh, it, you know the each path has a certain cost to it, for example, how long it takes or how much gas consumption it will, it will you know, consume or will cost. And so you have to find the optimal uh, course of action. Of course, when you have 37 cities, uh, it becomes very difficult to do it sort of by hand. And so there are algorithms, operations research algorithms, that in this case minimize the cost for the traveling salesman. There are, in other cases, you're trying to optimize something. Look at the problem on the right. It's called the two-dimensional cutting stock problem. This is actually a problem that I worked on. I was a research assistant 
uh, during my undergrad and during part of my MBA at a research center known as uh, GERAD, which stands for Group d'études et de recherche en analyse de décision, uh, research group in the analysis of decisions. Uh, it's a it was a it's a research center affiliated with the University of Montreal and McGill University, and so I was working on a problem uh, as part of a team, uh, trying to uh, tackle this problem known as the two-dimensional cutting stock problem. The problem works as follows. You've got these sheets, rectangular sheets of uh, metal or wood or glass, and then you get an order of, you know, to cut these larger sheets into smaller rectangles and squares. Let's say you need to cut 10 squares of, you know, uh, four by four, and then 30 rectangles of X by Y. How should you, you know, cut these on this greater sheet as to minimize the amount of waste, right? You can't fit these different uh, orders perfectly within the greater sheet. And so you have to find a way to uh, implement your guillotine cuts in such a way that you minimize the actual uh, wood or glass or metal or whatever the raw material is. And this is not a uh, obvious problem. But again, what you're doing is you are prescribing some optimal course of action. And so we've got normative decision making, we've got prescriptive decision making, and then now we move on to the third type of decision making research, which is descriptive decision making. This is very much uh, what a behavioral scientist uh, and a psychologist will typically do, right? They don't necessarily care about some normative norms of rationality. They don't care about prescribing some optimal course of action. They simply wish to understand actual behaviors, actual decisions. And so they're describing a process. And so if you look, for example, at this uh, uh, informational display board, you have uh, four cars, each of which is uh, scored on four attributes, price, quality, safety, and mass per gallon on a scale of one to seven. One is the worst, seven is the best. Each of these attributes is also given a uh, attribute weight, which basically captures how important that attribute is to you. And so as I navigate through this informational display board, there are uh, different ways by which I could arrive to a winning alternative. So for example, if I were to implement the lexicographic rule, this would work as follows. I would look at the most important attribute, in this case it's price, because it has the highest weight, and I would choose that alternative that scores the highest on that attribute. In this case, it's car A, it scores a seven, and so I would choose car A. On the other hand, if I had used the satisficing rule, it, basically the rule would work as follows. I would choose the first alternative that passes all of my four minimal cutoffs. So if you see at the bottom of the informational display board, there are these cutoffs. These are called also aspirational levels. This is the minimal level that I am willing to accept an alternative. And so uh, car A, uh, fails because on safety it it fails the its cutoff. Car B fails because already on price it fails its respective cutoff. Whereas car C, if you look at each of its scores, it passes all four cutoffs. So I would choose it. So depending on which decision rule I use, uh, will lead me to a com to a completely different decision in some cases. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm simply describing a process, right? And so again. Oftentimes you have a tension between, between these different research streams because their raison d'etre is really quite different, right? The classical economist develops this stylized model of how we ought to behave and then compares behavior to that stylized model. The, the, the prescriptive researcher cares about optimality and so he, ha he or she has to solve actual problems uh, by either minimizing or maximizing some metric. And of course the behavioral scientist in most cases uh, simply wishes to describe what people actually do. And so there you have it, folks, uh, normative, prescriptive, and descriptive decision-making. Have a great week, everyone. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.